Right, now, we'll just quickly summarise some of the things from that video, particularly the thing about the comet, the big deals and the takeaways. What did you, apart from the tragedy of the process, what were the things that you probably took away the most? Don't punch rivets, because it can create... Okay, rivets, rivets punch through, create stress raises, something that they were discovering the consequence of. Processes become important. So knowing how you're processing a material is just as important as what the material is like, how it's made, what it does, its properties. You can alter things through the processing. Unforeseenly, you know, you can go out of your way to prepare it that way. Something interesting about that too that they didn't make a big deal of was that although the windows weren't particularly square, they had rounded corners, um, the consequence of that sort of familiarity of windows being somewhat rectangular, they changed the design in the next series and they made them more oval-like, in fact a little bit more egg-shaped um, so that the stresses would change the way I went around the windows. And if you have, have a look at aircraft from that period, particularly the passenger aircraft, they're, they're very rarely going to have that sort of rounded edged window. One of the things I remember somebody saying, it might have been James, saying that um, uh, do they still make them out of that thin material? And the answer I gave was no, they make it out of thinner stuff. Um, and the thing that's different is that it's generally now a sandwich, meaning that there's something else added that gives it the rigidity that it needs and, and helps with that protecting from that ripping process that is still catastrophic at pressurised times. You know. um, it's still a problem. I mean, aircraft at higher altitudes are still pressurised. So, you know, you really do have to design your, your passenger cylinder very well. What, what else? What, 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 anything else in particular that came out of that? I made some comments about the materials. We're going to be looking at that today. I just wanted to round it off before you left it. Um, yeah, Re cyclic loading. Cyclic loading is a big issue that they didn't really understand. And fatigue was the other terminology used. Uh, so we've got to be thinking in terms sometimes of, you know, what are the effects that, have, that happen over time if you are repeatedly loading the material? Now, Sort of, sort of, I think it's in this unit, but I think there's somewhere along the line we do have a look at a diagram which talks about the relationship between cyclic loading and strength deterioration. It basically comes across as, as you know, your stress strain diagram, um, slightly sort of different, is that, that you can see there's a strength level for a particular material might be at this elevated point, but as time goes on over cycles, it starts to deliberately, d definitely come down to a point where it weakens to the point where any cycling after that isn't going to make any major differences. But if you were aiming at designing for a material that was in this region, which you figured was below its normal weight, or, you know, a factor of safety. Now in the particular one, the example given in the um, comet was that they were designing to the limits. That was the other thing I wanted to mention. You hear them say they were designing to the limits. Um, that was where they made a, another error is that in order to lighten the weight, because aircraft being in the air, not like boats, they need to be light. Um, and that's gonna be part of the conversation today. So they were aiming, even though it was below, somewhere in the region below the maximum, the cyclic loading created a situation where eventually they were actually above the maximum. So this is, if you like, in, over time, this is the position of the UTS, the ultimate tensile stress or the ultimate stress for it, and cyclic loading lowers it. And you, if you're designing for an area here, over time you actually step outside of that. So it's, it was only a matter of, as I said, it was only a matter of time before the aircraft was gonna crash, or at least something catastrophic was gonna happen. I did uh, mention at the end of the uh, talking to you about the fact that uh, the Australian invention of the black box, box becomes a, an important thing in order for people to investigate and re-establish re what happens in aircraft crashes over the next 30, 40 years. Um, there was another Australian thing that um, was interesting related to the comment story. Uh, there was a gentleman writing books at the time, um, a very famous Australian guy, who wrote um, A Town Like Alice, um, Neville Shute, and he wrote another book about this same time called No Highway in the Sky. 
and there was a movie released um, around the same idea of metal fatigue. Uh, and it was looking at an aircraft whose tail would fall off. Um, basically, it was a metal fatigue problem. So if you ever want to have a look at a really good old-fashioned film um, based on metal fatigue and the understanding in the late 40s and early 50s, then that's one to go for. It's called No Highway in the Sky. You should be able to find it and get it cheap. Um, probably download it for nothing. It's that old, but it's a good film. Um, okay, so today we're going to look at one of the most important materials for aircraft design and it leads out of the ideas with the comet because it talks about using thin skinned aluminium so we want to back up now and go back into the history part and remind ourselves of what is aluminium all about now i've talked about it many times and told you that you know like if you go back 200 300 years aluminium was a very rare material and valuable and on an equal par with materials like silver and gold and that was largely because of the refining process now what do you need for refining an ore you need two things you need a reducing atmosphere that is an atmosphere that removes impurities and most of the metal ores we find in large enough quantities for us to refine are going to have some form of oxygen perhaps attached to it or some other element that has made it stable in our environment. So iron oxide stabilizes the iron so it remains reasonably inert within the environment. But it's no good to build anything out of it because iron oxide being a covalently bonded material behaves more like a ceramic and it's a rock really. You know, so the whole of the Hammersley Ranges are reddened with the iron oxide but it's rich enough for us to dig out of the ground and if we can refine it put it into a reducing atmosphere to get rid of the oxygen then we can get a pure metal out of it iron the other thing you need apart from a reducing atmosphere is extreme temperature or high temperature and extreme temperature is probably not the right word but by comparison aluminium required extreme temperatures those sorts of temperatures that weren't likely to be found in the technologies that we had, the blast furnace style of, forging, of, of, of refining metals and creating a liquid metal that you could pour and mould and so on. Right? Aluminium, though, is abundant. It's, it, it, it makes up a good percentage, if not a greater percentage, of what you find in the Earth's crust apart from the minerals and rocks. So if you just go and find some basic Earth out there, it's going to be... Um, an aluminium um, uh, combination with calcium and potassium and oxygen and various forms um, but it's an aluminium material it's just not in concentrated enough for us to to make that mining process worthwhile so we find areas where we've got enrichments of that aluminium concentrations and the material that's called for that is bauxite and luckily when, in australia we get a fair bit of bauxite um, it's not uncommon around the world. The, the Russians have got deposits, the Americans have got deposits, deposits in, uh, North, uh, in Europe that they can use too, but we've got quite a bit here. Right? Um, again, being a large flat country, it's been around a very long time, there's a lot of good minerals available in this country and metals and, and ores to get. So, aluminium required a different type of refining process that wasn't available until the late 1800s, and that was electrolytic processing. So that means that now, once you get past the problem of the high temperatures and you get the right sorts of reducing atmospheres and you can produce this material on a large enough quantity, then you start looking for things to use it for. And aluminium was immediately recognized as being a very lightweight material. It's also recognized as a pretty good conductor. The difference was that uh, between, say, using it for copper wire and so on, it was that when it's made into a thin wire, it's reasonably easy to break. Uh, it's not that robust, tough. So copper remains still the, the wire of choice, even though aluminium has a slightly better uh, conductivity. Uh, when you start making really big wires, though, and big thick pieces that can give some strength to the aluminium, then you come into its own. So later when we talk about telecommunications, we'll be looking at the fact that the high-tension wires that do the 3,000, 4,000 volt things that carry the, from the power supplies, uh, from the generation stations, they're aluminium. And if they were made out of copper, they'd be so heavy, they'd probably sag under their own weight, and you'd have to build more towers 
So we'll talk more about that later. But aluminium is used as the core of most of the high tension wire. Um, and it's also made up of composite materials as well. So, um, all right, so turn of the century, last century that is, 1900s, aluminium is being looked at and they start doing experiments with it, just the same as you would for uh, iron. And so if iron can be alloyed and you can make other materials like copper alloys, what happens if you start throwing some alloying material into pure aluminium? And in 1903, some German scientists were looking at it. And one particular gentleman came up with a material that had 4% copper in it that he noticed that when you heated it up and you quenched it reasonably quickly, that's just you know getting it cool faster than your normalizing rate. Then if you left it a little while, and came back, it was much harder than it was when you, you left it there. And you said, what happened? So it wasn't like it hardened up straight away. Like you get from steel. If you heat steel and you quench it, right away the material is hard and brittle. But you could still machine it and form it for a while after you've got it into this state and then leave it and it would harden up. It would age harden. Now, it took a while for him to work out how that would take place, but they did make that observation. Why, why it would harden up had to do with the movement of the copper alloys inside the lattice until the copper alloys would join up into a bunch inside the lattice work and distort the lattice more. Remember, going back, why do things deform in the first place? How can they deform? They need a mechanism within them. They need that latitude, they, they need inside the lattice, they need the latitude to move or slide or have these dislocations that allow for like zippers taking place within the material. So that they can move from one place to another. That's deformation. So going right back to the beginning of year 11, remember materials only have two responses to load. One, get out of the road, which is break, or hold the load somehow by deforming. Deformation becomes critical to being able to hold load. Plastic deformation is permanently deforming and that comes about as a result of these mechanisms, slip planes and dislocations. Hardening is stopping that process from taking place. Pure metals tend to give the best results for ductility and malleability. As soon as you start alloying things into them, you start to get in the road of those slip planes and those mechanisms. The, the uh, um, dislocations get changed in a way, in fact they get uh, they run into these foreign alloys and change the properties altogether. So it's the same sort of idea, but what was unusual about this new material was that you could form it and shape it and then leave it and it would harden up for you, rather than have to work it first and then do the heat treatment. So that made it slightly easier to work with. So you could roll it into sheets and things and then do the heat treatment stuff and then bend it and shape it and just let it go and it'd harden up. This age hardening process, they named the material, by the way, I just gave it a, a, a name, duralium. Uh, duralium becomes the standard name, although today we don't tend to name them on that. We have a different system today. The system tends to be based on a thousand numbers. You know, so you, you have the steels in the thousands and you have the aluminium alloys in the 2000 series. Um, so 2,000 and something would be an indication, 2,040 might be an indication of 4% copper and 1% magnesium or something along those lines. All right, so, you know, the, that's, that's our designation today. But most people still talk about it as duralium or the Americans duralium and aluminum, whatever they pronounce, however they pronounce it. All right, so 2003 German scientists coming up with these new materials. Uh, 2003, 1903, 1903. Just around the corner, of course, we've got World War I. Now, we've already looked at how important World War I was to the development of aircraft. And I just want to revisit for a very short moment some of the things about aircraft design that comes out of that period. Right? They start out, remember, with that box shape. That was the idea of having lift created by two large wing surfaces and you support it with your body went through the middle of it. Largely just timber frames with canvas covering, um, pretty much very lightweight. The motors weren't at this stage terribly powerful. So motors are being developed. Applications start to dictate what you're going to use them for. 
So as you start to get into dogfighting situations where you're turning and, and, and pulling Gs, the aircraft airframe has to improve. So you now need to think about how can I change the design of the aircraft and streamline it, strengthen the wings, and all of those sorts of things so that you can create an advantage for the pilot so he survives the situation he's in and can come back to fight another day. All right, so these are all start, these are the things we talked about already. By the end of World War I, the fighter pilot show, the fighter designs had gotten to a place where they were thinking that the biggest problem, well, there's two real big problems. Is one is keeping the wings attached to the fuselage. If you're turn, pu pulling G's and turning things around, and the top wing, going back to the old design box design, and your fuselage is down under here, and you're sitting in here, so that you can see out through there, the bottom, the top wing is usually suspended above. So it's got some space underneath. That creates a weakness along here for ripping the wings off and all sorts of issues. There. They very quickly recognise that the best design for a fighter, now um, this is going to sound a bit weird because you think, well, um, the wings get in the road of you seeing things. But in fighter situations, the attack is normally going to come from behind. The only time you need the wing out of the road in the front is when you want to see the guy you're attacking. So the wing on top wasn't a problem at first, but later on it became quite a problem for visualizing where you were being attacked from and attacking. So if we can get rid of the top wing and just have one wing underneath, and so the monoplane became very popular towards the end of the war. Now I'm just going to draw a sketch here that, that just to give you an idea because I wanted to draw it so that you could see that the wing underneath could be made as one full body. It didn't have to be attached to the sides, it could run right through and spars would run underneath. So you're basically sitting the fuselage on top of the wing, not suspending the fuselage under the wing. But they're going to say, Mr. Wise, I know there are a few planes around now that are suspended like that. The Cessna type aircraft that are the real popular little flying round ones. There's a difference. That's not a fighter plane. Right? You don't think about Cessnas in terms of fighting with them. You think about Cessnas as flying from one place to another with people looking out the windows. So a high slung wing, no big full G stuff. It's actually not a bad plane for flying if you're a recreational flyer. You want to see what's going on around you. Looking up ain't particularly interesting, it's just the sky. You can see that from the ground. So you basically don't want a wing underneath you. Now, for, for fighter planes though, it's very important. Now the other thing you might say, well you can't see anybody coming from underneath then. What's the problem there? Why don't they attack from underneath? That's a, not an easy thing to do. Um, I mentioned in, when I was looking at fighter planes before how you have to be aware that when you're firing bullets, the moment they leave the front of your aircraft, the front of the gun, they start falling. So if you think about it and you're coming up, say there's an aircraft above you, and you think, oh, I'll come up from underneath because here's the aircraft flying above me, and I'm going to come up underneath him, and he won't see me because I'm coming up under here and he's, it's blind. Right? But can you imagine what sort of physics you have to have in your head so that you start firing so that the bullets don't go underneath the aircraft? So you've really got to be sort of going like this to fire so that they actually hit the plane that's above you. And it's not an easy task to shoot from underneath towards something. So they weren't particularly worried about it. Right? So two things about fighter planes. Monoplanes were more efficient because you didn't have the problems of the, the wings falling off on the top. You could get rid of the top wing so your vision was better. Um, you could also go faster. And also the materials by now, they're starting to change. They had strengthened things up. They were using metal sparring. And the one that comes in at this point is that there was a fighter being developed by a fellow named Junkers, Hugo Junkers. Um, later on in World War II, the Junker name would become quite popular, or at least well known, the Junker 88 and things like this. Um, the other name that you hear about is Heinkel. Uh, these two designers were very pronounced, very um, dominant fighter pilots and bomber pi uh, fighter um, um, designers. But Junkers was one of the first to think in terms of, let's use this new material, this duralium. I mean, it's a German invention anyway, so why don't we use it? And uh, typical for the Germans, um, and it's just there, the, the way they were, 
is that their inventions that could have changed the war always arrive at the end of the war. The Messerschmitt jet arrives at the end of the war, could have changed the war. The V1 and V2s arrive, or the V2 in particular arrives at the end of the war, could have changed the war, had it been a year or two earlier. And here's the same thing. Junkers comes up with a monoplane that has a, a, an aluminium skin. And the streamlining and the strength out of that aluminium skin made an extremely fast and maneuverable aircraft. It could have been a game changer. The Junkers D1 uh, could have been a game changer. But it <laughs> gets built in 1918. You know, again, right at the end of the war. But the ideas behind it changed the things that were being done. Something else he did, um, you remember I mentioned to you that they, the, the Germans were really good at coming up with um, mid-range, good mid-range aircraft using three engines, the tri-motors and the Junker tri-motor, that's a very uh, formidable looking aircraft, had corrugated aluminium on the skin on the outside. Looks like a you know, barn with corrugated steel on the side of it. Um, the design would be carried over into things like the Spirit of St. Louis, the aircraft that flew from, uh, flew across the Atlantic that Lindbergh flew in, and in the Australian Southern Cross, the tri-motor that's in the Southern Cross. If you look at the sides of the aircraft, they've got that familiar box shaping, but the earliest ones had this corrugated aluminium skin. Um, again, using the duralium process, because the material could be heat treated rolled into corrugations so you can manipulate it and then just leave it and it would harden up over time. Now there are some downsides and the downsides are the things that were in the comet. That until you realize that this age hardening process can be accelerated to a detrimental way by cyclic loading and temperature. Temperature becomes an important thing. I don't know whether you noticed that most of those flights when they were where they the route on which most of those flights was was going through the Mediterranean and through the Mediterranean area into reasonably warm conditions Rome and, and, and that area was where those two planes crashed the previous two that had crashed before that which was shown to be storm related rather than to do with this was also in that area one was in North Africa um, because that was the flight that Britain was looking mostly at, because the empire was along that line, and that's how you flew, and particularly coming here too, if you wanted to later, that was the direction. You still flew over Europe. You still fl flew through the Mediterranean and went through the Middle East. Right? So temperature in the environment you were flying in. You would think that, hang on, wouldn't cold make things more brittle, more likely to do that? Yes, except that what we're talking about in age hardening is the movement of atoms and the changing positions of the atoms. So again, let's just remind ourselves of, of um, the lattice structure on a material and what might happen if you have another material. Now, the, the, the other material is either going to be one of two things. It can only be one of two things. If it isn't the same atom, it's going to be either bigger or smaller. So if it's really smaller, it'll fit into the spaces, interstitially spaced. If it's reasonably similar, but bigger, it might fit into a location, substitutionally within the location. In either case, they become problems for the slip planes to work if they have to go up and over or climb over because it's a slightly different size. When you heat the material up and you cause it to, remember everything's vibrating all the time. So when you cause it to vibrate, you vibrate it more. You open the spaces up. And if the spaces become large enough, you can get what's called solid state precipitation, where things precipitate out of solution and collect. Now in a solution, in a, a chemical solution, you talk about a precipitate being that that maybe drifts to the bottom by gravity. And it's due to do with the motion in the water, how fast that happens, uh, what the fluid's doing, and, and um, Brownian motions and things like this, whether there's suspension enough or whether it's too slow. A, a pool of muddy water, if you leave it long enough, the mud 
falls out of suspension and you get a layer at the bottom and reasonably fresh water after it. Right? Well, think like that in this term too, because basically the foreign bodies, which don't have a direct relationship in a bonding way to the structure itself, can be induced by temperature to change their position. Now, if they're like materials and they want to form together, they will try to collect together. And you may finish up with large concentrations somewhere in the material of these foreign elements, either big ones or little ones. And that creates even more of a problem for the dislocations to move, almost to the point where it may cancel them out altogether. And when that happens, you no longer have a way of deforming, so you are at your limits and you finish up breaking. So age hardening has some good sides to it in that you can get something that is more resistant to indentation, abrasion, scratching, stiffer, so that it's got some properties there that you like, but you've got to be careful that you don't go too far down that road and turn it into a brittle material, in which case now any hole you punch through it, any rivet you put through it, any changes you make later, any scratches and deep ones that come into it, that's going to be problematic. And that's what happened with the comet. They just didn't know. They now do. We design around those things. The other thing that um, happens when you add an alloy or an alloying element to a pure metal, particularly aluminium. Aluminium is a really cool material in that it's um, one of those materials which self protects from corrosion. The oxidization layer that causes it, that, that goes on the outside, that forms with the aluminium bonding along the outside with the oxygen, actually builds up a layer that is reasonably resistant to further corrosion. I mean, you can, over time, you can pit corrode. That's a big problem for aircraft. That comes up with this material as well, as you'll see in a moment. Or you may have noticed that, you know, leave, leave aluminium out for a while, it will cray. It'll get this white powdery material looking on the surface of it and, it, and, and sort of lumpy up a bit, but nowhere near as quick as steel or iron. Iron and oxides of uh, uh, iron, they, you get rust just sitting it out in the open on a normal day because the humidity in the air will be enough. But you put it into an aqueous situation, water or something like that, you're going to rust it away really quickly. And if you've got two dissimilar metals around, that corrosion process takes even faster. It happens even faster. All right. So aluminium's pretty stable. So it makes it pretty good to use just as it is. And so you might see a lot of photos of old aircraft that are nice and shiny because the aluminium wasn't polished, it was just polished up and not painted. Why wouldn't you paint an aircraft? It's metal and nice looking. Metal and nice looking, not quite. It's, 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 it's one of those things you don't realise and as soon as you say it, you go, of course. No, extra weight. That's all it is. You know, for a long time, when you look at uh, pictures of aircraft from the, uh, you know, the, the early days of passenger aircraft, they only painted the top half of the aircraft. The wings stayed silver and the bottom half stayed silver and there was maybe a black line where the windows were and then a nice white roof on it sort of thing so to reflect the light off the, the sunlight off the top when it was flying so it didn't heat up the cabin. You don't paint your outside black. Right? Otherwise, you know, that, that's, that's going to be problematic for collecting heat, so you'd be spending more time cooling the aircraft down. So you just paint the surfaces that you... Uh, don't think like World War II planes, where you camouflage them in order to um, make them <coughs> invisible for you. you. It was better off having a paint job on a plane that was matte, that wouldn't reflect light, than make your plane really bright silver. Mm -hmm. Except for the Americans when they did their bombers, at, uh, because they said, well, everybody knows we're coming. So you might as well leave them silver in some of the B-52 bombers and things like this later and that sort of stuff. They just left it the same way because it was lighter to carry. Carry more bombs if you don't carry the paint. All right. So why do they paint them now? Because they don't worry about that anymore. The paints are thin. It's part of the, it can actually be a protective layer now. So they look more at that idea. Um, also, uh, livery becomes really important for recognizing which aircraft are, uh, so that when you go to the airport, you can see the pretty uh, Qantas planes and the, you know, who, who's got the nicest paint job um, really that's and it's advertising now 
But at first, it wasn't. In military aircraft, it, it's not that big a deal. So they just painted them so that it was more for camouflage. One of the other places where this happened, which was surprising, was um, Space Shuttle. The first of the Space Shuttles, when they started looking at painting and colouring it, that big solid, uh, the big liquid booster that you see on most of them as, as flat brown. Well, what would the, why they finished up with the flat brown is that was the undercoat. In the original designs, it was going to be painted really neat and nice looking, but they just realised that if you put an extra coat of paint on, it was going to cost them money. So they didn't do that, or cost them weight, rather. Not, and that would then eventually cost them money. So a lot of the um, early rocketry things, like you go and have a look at films of, you know, um, the early Mercury missiles and stuff like that. Um, they're, you know, silver because there's no paint on them. They might have painted the nose cone or something like that, but nothing else. Which is another one, just quickly, another side thing. You know all those videos you see of the rockets taking off and all that stuff that falls off the side of it? Ice. It's ice, yes, because of the liquid oxygen. Then it's frozen ice and as you start shaking the whole thing, so it looks like the paint job's falling off or something like that, it's not. Um, it's just bits of ice falling away from the aircraft. All right. Okay, so duralium is cool stuff for age hardening, but you've got to be aware that if you go overboard with it, cyclic load, or change the temperature conditions, elevate the temperature conditions, or use it in an elevated situation or a repeated cycle, then you could get a downside coming out of it. Now the third thing we want to talk about very briefly on aircraft materials is that today's type of materials are no longer that type of design. There's a design process that came out of World War II which was known as monocot construction. And the idea there was that you try to make the skin and the framing structural, not just part of the decoration or the covering so the air doesn't flow through the aircraft. So in the first place, the skin was to stop, well, on the wings, of course, it was to create the lift situation. But a lot of the early planes, the real early designs, they didn't cover the tails or the, the, the spar going out to the tail because there was no point. They weren't flying fast enough for a start, and there's nothing back there to worry about, the wind blowing through it. But eventually, once you start going fast, you need streamline, so you're covering everything. You know? So eventually, what they're saying was, well, if we're going to have to use the skin on the outside, why don't we stretch the skin and create a structural member out of it? And so by the mid-30s and 40s, towards the beginning of World War II, they started to do that. They stretched the skin to rivet the skin on and pull it as they were doing it so it, it became a structural member. And how that would work was pretty straightforward. You make a frame section that would lightweight frame section and the problem with a frame that is made in any shape other than a triangle, any curved surfaces or anything else, is that you are going to have some issues with stability. So we could do this. We could put a spar through there or a brace onto it to give it the triangulation process. Or we can do this, which is exactly what they finish up doing, is out of my frame, so this is continuing back different all these frame parts that you then put a skin of material over it you rivet that on and then you pull it and rivet so now there is a tensioning that is occurring in the skin that becomes your bracing you can't lengthen or shorten it without changing the materials inside that way or the other. So it's become your bracing material. The next decide is the design, the, the, the idea is how do you avoid having to make it in these sections? And so the idea was to make it in these thin lines that go right down the whole length of the aircraft and there'd be thin one here and then one would come along further up and another one coming around. I'll probably just do it like in the nose and then they come around the other side around the other side and you might have your cabin element up here right. and then you just put lightweight braces across the whole thing and then you get your skin and you stretch it across large sections and close it all in and you could leave the nose out here 
and before too long you've designed yourself the sort of bomber structure that became the most popular design for World War II where you had this clear section at the front where you could see out for the bombing run you had your pilot high and and the whole process was made out of one continuous spar like the long sections it was interesting too with the British would the, the, uh, again the British have been really good at aviation and the Comet as you saw was one of the first if not one of the better ones it certainly was a very uh, advanced form of passenger aircraft to begin with um, still I think is a very pretty aircraft even to today and remember I mentioned that the <laughs> The Americans tended to, to get a lot of their stuff from, from the military, so Boeing building them, and hence the hung engines underneath the wings because it was easier to maintain. You could just rip a wing off, uh, rip, rip an engine off, and put another one back in. Whereas the Comet, with its nice lines, you, to work on the engines, you had to really, you know, a little bit more difficult and a bit more problematic. So the, the 707 with the hung uh, underneath. Uh, motors was more a servicing thing, an economic servicing thing which comes out of military purposes. Um, and the other story I told you about too with that military stuff was the idea of you know, the guy who looked at where the damage was on the bombers and realised that the planes that came back, where the damage was, was not where you strengthened it. You strengthened it where there wasn't any damage because those ones didn't come back. And it seems counterintuitive, but it makes sense if you think about it. So if the aircraft in front of you is riddled with holes, and you think that plane came back and landed, I do not need to strengthen that plane, because it survived riddled with holes. What I need to do is find all the, one, the spots where there aren't any holes, and say that's where I put all the strengthening, because those ones didn't come back. That's a really clever way of thinking about designing, is where, it's, where it breaks is where you fix it not where it isn't broken. Anyway, okay, so today, what are we at today? We still use aluminium, we still use very thin aluminium, but we now tend to use composite structural materials where we amalgamate three or four materials together in a lamellar arrangement. That can give you insulatory processes too. It can double strength. It, you can use foam materials to lighten it up. One of the more popular ones is that, going back to the corrosion issue, there is a problem with duralium because of the addition of the copper, and I was getting to that before, because of the addition of copper, it can change the surface of the material and create problems for corrosion. And this type of corrosion I mentioned earlier, pit corrosion, can occur around collections of copper as the age hardening takes place. To avoid that, what they often did was to put a very thin layer of aluminium on the outside of the duralium. So you'd make your duralium up, you'd make that the element that was going to give the rigidity and the strength, that was the one you're looking for for those properties, and then cover it with another layer of pure aluminium. Very thin, you don't have to be very much because you're talking molecular structure here, you're talking atom level. So a very thin layer of pure aluminium on the outside. And you'll know the name of this because it's around a lot. We still use it. It's called Alclad. It's a brand name for that process of getting duralium and covering it with aluminium. It's aluminium on top of aluminium, but it's pure aluminium on top of the alloyed aluminium underneath. We also can add other alloys. Magnesium will help with um, machinability, silicon with machinability, right? So adding some silicon into the duralium will allow, uh, make it cut easier on a machine. Um, formability afterwards is improved by things like magnesium. Now these are not high level amounts, all right? So 4% copper doesn't sound like enough, a lot, but it's enough. And when you start talking magnesium and, and, and a silicon, you know, 1% is all you need to make a difference in ta taking the machinability out, um, improving the machinability. Seems like it's a very hard thing to do, a ridiculous thing to do, but remember, iron carbon diagrams and how little carbon you need to change the steel. Uh, the, the bottom end of the iron carbon diagram starts with points, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0.3% carbon. And then you get up to 0.8 and you start seeing massive changes 
and it's 0.8 percent. You know? We're talking by the time you get to four percent, the material is castable but unusable. You know? So it's not a lot. You don't need a lot to change some of these materials. All right. Sandwiches and um, sandwiches, not made sandwiches like ham. Sandwiches, but aluminium placed between two things or our skin on the outside of something else is the common go these days. I've got a video that we can watch and we've got some time over the next few days, quite a few of them. The next couple of classes I've got to look at some, some more of the engine, you know, look at the jet engine again, look at Bellini's principles, uh, those are the videos to watch. But there's one classic one that comes from the series that uh, the guy from um, Top Gear, um, Richard Hammond, does um, called Connections. And he shows how um, a cannon and a chicken are used to check uh, aircraft frame designs. Uh, basically, he fires kick chickens at windows and planes because what would be one of the biggest issues for a modern aircraft? Wild chickens. Well, wild chickens, not quite wild chickens. No, not flying chickens, but bird strike. Bird strike is a big issue. So, you know, aviation ma manufacturers now have to prove that their aircraft can handle bird strike. What's the... Um, the big story about bird strike that's happened in the last 10 years. It's a famous story. Wasn't there one in like, New York? It was New York, yeah. 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 And they landed in the Hudson. They landed in the Hudson, yes. He survived. They, the, the plane that the, the, the captain managed to turn around and bring back and land in the Hudson. It was a bird strike issue. Uh, the birds didn't survive, but everybody <laughs> else did. Um, so, but it's a big issue. And so it's funny. Well, we'll have a look at it. It's quite funny. Um, it, it went into the engine. So you now have to design your engines, particularly those. Uh, the, see the big fan. Remember we looked at uh, high bypass fan engines. All right. Those those propellers on the outer propellers. The fan blades. See, it's not a propeller. It's a fan. All right. Remember I told you that a propeller has the property of grabbing the air but also using the lift in front and the, dr and the, the lower pressure behind whereas a fan is just redirecting air it, it's it's really just so you can have a lot more blades because you want more blades um, not like a propeller anyway so they have to survive those sorts of in inputs and, and breakage um, with a jet engine uh, technically uh, really um, you could you once, if you chop the bird up enough, now this is sounding pretty goring, but, but, if, but if it hits the first fan and gets into the turbines and gets chopped up and the turbines survive, it'll just go straight through because it's, that's basically what the air's doing. So it, it would just have bits of bird coming out the back. <laughs> but it's not something you want to do because the damage you could do to the blades, remember what happens when the blades get out of sync. When you, it, the revs you're going at and the speed you're going at, if you get a damaged blade, that will therefore throw the balance out on the engine, and that can be very problematic. It's like yeah. um, the video of like, the guy throwing the brick into the, um, washing, the washing machine. Where it, all, it just goes crazy. Oh, it goes crazy. Yeah. Yes, it will. It'll break the washing machine. I'm sure it would. Yeah. 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 Anyway, we're, we're going to leave it there because that's about... That's not time. <laughs> <laughs> it's not the right time. It's well, not it's even moving, is it? Yeah, it's about 10 past. No, no. Yeah, the, it's, it's yeah. struggling. Oh, it's, <laughs> it's ticking away, but it's not going anywhere. Okay, so we'll finish there. So that's what we're going to be looking at next, is going back to looking at the engines, um, looking at the, the manufacture of the turbine engine. Um, yeah, that'll do. Yeah, uh, we'll come back to that.